Good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education, and welcome to uh, Business Over Breakfast. Very uh, glad that you can all join today. One thing for sure is that over the last couple of years of uh, while we've been living through uh, this pandemic, it's forced us to change our behaviors, whether it's um, sort of sanitizing surfaces and groceries, donning protective wear, living 24 seven with your spouses and kids, uh, shifting buying habits uh, to online. It, we've all changed in some way um, what we do. And many businesses have benefited from those, those shifts in behaviors, especially online retailers, meal delivery services, delivery producers. But the question is which of those behaviors are going to become or have become um, a habit? And will the propensity to use, say, restaurant delivery services be sustained now that mask mandates are, for the most part, gone and people are venturing back into, uh, into public spaces, especially here in Atlanta? There's, there's a lot of people out and about these days. So here with us to explore this question and how the, the shifts impact customer value for merchants, restaurateurs, is Assistant Professor of Marketing, Dan McCarthy. Dan's research leverages sophisticated statistical methods to understand complex marketing problems. He is an expert in customer lifetime value, and Dan has explored many facets of the food delivery service in particular, and, and has been featured on CNN and in leading journals for his research on Blue Apron. His current research applies state-of-the-art deep learning methodologies to predict what customers will spend and therefore, in turn, what the revenue expectations of companies as a whole will be. Before I hand the baton to Dan, though, I'd like to share a few, uh, few opportunities which you might find valuable. Um, on May 6th, we're opening registration for our extended learning courses. Uh, seats, these are seats in, in a number of executive and evening MBA electives, including um, Dan's Customer Lifetime Value course. So if you're interested in this topic or other marketing finance topics, and you'd like to earn you know, degree credits from Emory, please reach out. Classes start at the end of August and seats are very limited. So um, first in, first served. Also to help us really understand um, how to leverage technology and data for business, we are introducing a new program on AI and machine learning, really to generate new insights and opportunities for business people. So that's led by uh, Professor Jesse Boxted, and he's going to be joining us for a business over breakfast on June 2nd. Um, today, Dan is gonna spend the first say 30, 35 minutes sharing his research-based insights, followed by a Q and A. Throughout the session though, please do post your questions in the Q and A box and I will Get them to Dan along the way so that um, he's happy to answer questions as, as he goes. And then we've also got some time at the end to um, just focus on questions. So um, with that, Dan, over to you. All right, thanks so much, Nicola. And uh, yeah, really excited to, to be with you here today. Uh, as those of you may know, the thing that really gets me up in the morning, gets me really excited is uh, predicting what customers will do. and not just kind of predicting single behaviors, but really understanding, you know, for entire companies, how do they acquire customers? How long do those customers stay? And then using uh, models like that that kind of tie all together all the way back to overall company revenue, use that to understand you know, how well are these companies doing and how healthy are they? And in some sense, this work is kind of a generalization of that. You're going to feel that same spirit that we're going to, you know, take something like, uh, overall revenue. Now it's going to be overall revenue within the restaurant delivery category, but we're going to break it down to understand you know, how that revenue come about. You know, was, how was it affected by new people entering the category for the very first time? Uh, you know, people being active after they, after they first adopted. Um, increasing purchase frequency while they're active and uh, potentially spending more uh, when they make those purchases. And so we're going to kind of take that same sort of framework, uh, but apply it to understand uh, you know, kind of how well the, the restaurant delivery category is doing. Uh, but this work is even a little broader than that in the sense, as Nicola was alluding to, that we want to understand 
you know, what are the, the short, medium, and long run effects of COVID? And uh, I mean, obviously it's something that's affected our lives in many, many, many ways. You know, here I am in my basement. <laughs> um, and I'm sure many of you are too. Uh, you know, what we wanna know is how much of the change that we've been observing from COVID uh, is likely to linger uh, for a longer period of time into the future and how much of it is likely to have gone away. And so there's just been a lot of questions, especially recently, uh, that have been uh, raised about this. And so I think that this work ties very nicely into, into some of those questions as well. So I'm gonna share my screen over here. Uh, hopefully now everyone should be able to see it. Um, yeah, this work, it's, uh, it's joint with a, a PhD student from Columbia, uh, Elliot Chin Oblander, uh, who's, who's really the, the genius behind this pro project. And the, the title is somewhat provocative, but you know, in some sense, they're, they're actually, it's not either or. Uh, you can have uh, behavior of being persistent uh, while still being a fading trend. And so you know, there's a question, do we observe uh, evidence that these behavior changes that we've made are gonna persist into the future even after COVID's gone? Is there evidence that those uh, changes are going away? Uh, or is it some combination of the both? And I think as we're gonna see, it is kind of some combination of the both. <clears throat> So just a, a little background, obviously, again, as I was mentioning, it's, COVID has changed how we exercise, it's changed how we consume content, you know, moving from movie theaters, uh, adopting a lot more streaming services and or uh, engaging with the streaming services that we have a lot more. It's changed how we eat, uh, eat our dinner at night, and it's changed how we've gotten our groceries, and, and it's changed us in a myriad of other ways as well. And I think it's spurred on a lot of articles with um, superlative titles, <laughs> I put it that way, where they say, you know, COVID has changed everything permanently. We've heard all these statements about a hundred years of growth happened in a year. And, uh, and it's not to dispute some of that, but maybe it's to kind of say, well, you know, I I'm sure some of that's true, but maybe some of that was uh, the sugar high in the immediate kind of onset of COVID. And now that things have kind of tapered a bit, you know, maybe, maybe we're giving back some of those gains. And so there's this question, you know, like for this title over here, it's transformed business. Has it transformed business forever? And I, I think forever is a, a pretty strong word. And maybe in some ways it has changed things forever. But whenever I see words like that, usually I think, well, you know, someone's trying to sell me something. And I think the big question here again is, uh, what are the, the short run effects and how, how might they be different from the medium to long run effects? And how might they actually be different across different categories? And <clears throat> I think that that's really the main question that we're looking to answer to this work. So again, we wanna know first, what's the absolute magnitude of the impact and how has that absolute magnitude been changing over time? And what can that tell us about, you know, what the, the new normal might look like uh, as we make our way out of COVID right now. So we're gonna focus on restaurant delivery, um, but the same approach that we use, and in fact, even exactly the same data set that we use uh, to, to analyze the restaurant delivery category, we could use to analyze each of these other categories as well. Grocery delivery with Instacart, you know, the streaming services with your Netflix and your Amazon, Amazon Prime Video, um, you know, obviously Peloton. So you know, we're gonna focus on restaurant delivery, but it really is kind of without loss of generality. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is to the extent that you have any questions, uh, please, uh, please chime in. I, I'd love to get them. Uh, we'll take questions throughout the talk. You don't need to feel like uh, you should wait till the end. So I'm gonna keep the chat box open. Um, yeah, I think Nicola as well is gonna be um, yeah, monitoring it, but uh, yeah, please, please don't be shy. I think uh, if you have a question, other people are probably thinking the same thing and I'd be happy to, to take it throughout. <clears throat> so uh, this work, it, it's already gotten some attention. Actually, let me um, put in a, a link to it. So this is a, a link to the paper I put in the, the chat box right now. Uh, it's been making some waves. So uh, it's been featured, just this work has been featured in Fast Company, in the journal a couple of times, The Economist, uh, Axios, New York Post, New Yorker, Bloomberg, NPR. It's been 
in most popular media. So, um, so hopefully you'll, you'll find it to be interesting. And I'm gonna be tying it in uh, to, to recent events as well uh, as we move to the end of the talk. So uh, hopefully you'll see it's uh, both interesting and current, like even as of uh, news that's been coming out this week. <clears throat> now you may wonder, how can we analyze the overall restaurant delivery category in great detail? And the reason why we can do it is because of a company called Earnest Research. They're a credit card panel data company uh, and all that means is that they observe for about 2 million people, all of their credit and debit transactions uh, over a very long period of time. So imagine that we could observe your credit and debit transactions across all your various cards uh, over this relatively long period of time from January, 2016 through July, 2021. That's basically what we're able to observe. And we can observe every single individual transaction at a whole bunch of different restaurant delivery companies, not only DoorDash, Uber Eats, and Grubhub, but also all of the other smaller ones too, uh, including those that have, um, you know, that had been operating before, but have shut down since like Amazon restaurants. So there's no survivorship bias or anything else uh, like that that would uh, potentially confound our analysis. So it's a really nice view of how people are behaving and it allows us to see, you know, at the, at the individual level, uh, how people's spending behavior has been evolving within the category. So hats off to them. Uh, I would recommend reaching out to them if, if you are interested in, in understanding these sorts of results for your company. So again, as I mentioned uh, on the title slide, what I really care about is not just like top line revenue, how's revenue changing? We can all easily uh, pull charts like that together. What we understand is how does that break down? How's it changing how people are adopting these services and, and retaining them? And so I'm just going to kind of take a pass through uh, four different ways that we can think about that the revenue shift that COVID has created within the restaurant delivery category. So first, let's think about uh, new customer adoption. So from our standpoint, what this represents is the number of people who, for the very first time, tried a restaurant delivery service. And what we can see is there was kind of a, a steady increase until early 2019, and then a fairly steady decrease. And then COVID hit, boom, you know, we see this really sharp increase in customer acquisition. And, uh, and that does kind of look like a sugar hop. <laughs> um, so it was very sharp, but it was also very short lived. And we can see that as of July of 2021, we're actually well below uh, pre-pandemic levels. Now you adopt uh, individuals into the category and then they subsequently uh, make purchases after that. And that's what gives us the total number of active customers uh, at different points in time. So this just represents the total number of people who've made any uh, purchases at all within the category, whether they're new or whether they're uh, existing. And so what the blue here represents are uh, all of the active customers who had been acquired before COVID started. And so the new customers that, uh, that uh, I guess it's kind of like a blend between pink and, and red. <laughs> uh, what that represents are all the, the active customers who had been born during the COVID period. And what we can see is, you know, it's kind of a steady increase in active customers before COVID. And then again, we see this very sharp increase in, uh, in the number of active customers during COVID. While customers are active, they're also placing more orders. So we can see from this chart, if we just kind of focus on that light blue line, that represents the orders per active customer for all the customers who had been acquired before COVID. It, people had tended to place on average, call it 1.3 orders a week while they were active. But we can see at, as COVID had started, you know, we saw a sharp increase in that, uh, probably because of people who were placing more orders within the week and potentially placing orders for lunch as well as dinner. And then finally, uh, COVID also uh, impacted how much we spent when we placed those orders. So when, when people used to place orders before COVID started, they were, play, they were spending on, or, on average, call it $31 uh, per, per order. And we can see that that jumped up uh, after COVID to, to 35. And there was even a brief period of time where it was closer to $37, $38. So, so you can see it, it really, it impacted all of these different behaviors. People were coming into the category more. They were being retained more. They were ordering more frequently while they were active and they were spending more. <clears throat> so it's kind of no surprise that we're, we're seeing this, 
dramatic uh, increase in revenue, it's because literally every single lever that could be driving improvement in revenue, they're all kind of moving in the upward direction. Now, one more interesting thing is we can see from these charts that a lot of the expansion or virtually all of it was because of expansion of activity from customers who had been acquired before COVID started. <clears throat> so uh, of that increase in active customers, we can see the vast majority of that was due to an expansion in active activity from existing customers. We can see that existing customers placed way more orders than, than customers acquired during COVID. And <clears throat> even though new and existing customers were spending about the same amount right after COVID started, uh, we can see that the uplift in basket size has been maintained more strongly with those customers that were acquired before COVID. <clears throat> so no matter how we cut it, uh, the vast majority of the spending increases because of existing customer expansion. Customers acquired before COVID started, they're doing a lot more stuff, basically. So without loss of generality, what this also means we can do is we can focus our attention on just what's going on with those existing pre-COVID customers. The new customers, they just really don't play much of a role in terms of uh, the lift that we've seen. So that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, yeah, to Eduardo, he was asking, uh, is this data for the US? Uh, th that's correct. Um, Earnest Research, their panel represents the activity from people within the United States. So we don't have coverage of people outside the US. <clears throat> uh, to my understanding, there is one credit card panel data company that has data uh, for the European market. And there are other similar data sources that are available for the Chinese market, but we're, we're focusing on the US uh, in this talk. Now, the high level approach we're going to take, I'm going to keep it very, very high level, <clears throat> but the, the high level approach is what we call an event study. So this is a chart. We're just going to take all the customers who had made their very first purchase the, the week ending March 3rd, 2019. And what we're looking at here is all of their uh, spending per cohort member. So just take all the spend from those customers each week and divided by the number of customers that were within that cohort. And what we can see is there's kind of this general, almost like a smiley face shape to it, that there's a, a gentle decline in spending um, per cohort member uh, until COVID started. And then we see this very sharp increase in, in spending. And so if we wanna quantify the impact of COVID, like what did COVID do? Well, the big question is, what would sales have been in a no COVID world for this cohort? And so what an event study will do is they'll say, all right, this is a little too much information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, to just close my eyes and I'm going to focus just on the pre-COVID period on the no COVID data. And I'm going to use that to make a forecast of what I would have expected to happen in the, in the COVID period uh, in the absence of COVID. So imagine that we were to forecast uh, this, this baseline. Then if we kind of pull that chart back up again, we can say, well, if that's what we would have expected in a no COVID world, then this is the impact of COVID. And this is how it's evolving over time. Okay. Dan, there's a question in the, the chat um, from Aravind. Is this per active customer within that cohort or per initially acquired customer? The latter. Yeah, this is per initially acquired customer. And that's why uh, we see that gentle decline. It's because of customer churn. And then it's coming up again, uh, I think because of a combination of seasonality and because of favorable dynamics within the restaurant delivery category. But yeah, the, the denominator is not changing over time. It's just the total number of people who had been in the cohort. It's a, it's a good question. <clears throat> now, Obviously, the question you might be wondering is, well, how did we pick that red line here? And, you know, looking at that data, if you just kind of eyeball it and say, well, we see it kind of picking back up at the very end of the data set, at the end of the, the no COVID period, maybe we should extrapolate that forward, then we get a line like this. But then someone else could say, well, you know, we see this kind of like smiley face shape, maybe we should expect another smiley face shape over the, the COVID period. So maybe the line should look like this. And it's really hard to say if we were to just focus on the no COVID period, exactly which line we should choose. So we, we can't just use naive extrapolation, but what we can do is 
we can move from calendar time to cohort time. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that, that X axis at the very bottom over there. If you just kind of stare at that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete it and replace it with tenure. Tenure represents the number of weeks since the cohort was first born. And so what they're saying is, you know, by week 52, uh, you know, average, average sales per cohort member was about, you know, $4 and 50 cents. And what we can then do is we can take this cohort and compare it to other cohorts that were uh, born at other periods of time where in tenure time, they were not impacted by COVID. So here's, uh, here's a chart. Again, the, the, the March 3rd, 2019 cohort, that's still there. But what we've added is the March 5th, 2017 cohort. And we know over the first two years of this cohort, they were not impacted by COVID. You know, two years forward, that's you know, beginning of March, 2019. And the, the very interesting thing is we can see this very regular tenure effect. So that same smiley face shape that we saw for the 2019 cohort, we can see it for the 2017 cohort too, that there's this amazing regularity of cohort behavior uh, as a function of tenure. Now, what we can also see is these lines are not perfectly overlapping with each other. You know, there are level shift differences between the two. So there's, there is a tenure effect that if you gave me how much the cohort spends at the beginning of its life, I can kind of help trace out uh, how, how that spending is gonna evolve over a function of tenure. But there's also these level shift differences which are due to the fact that these cohorts were born at different periods of time. So if we were to overplot other cohorts, they could basically fall uh, somewhere along uh, this trajectory that I'm showing right over here. So, yeah. yes. We've got another couple of questions. Um, one from Sabrina, does this model also assume same store sales over the COVID period? She says many new restaurants added during service. Yeah, so this is not making any assumptions about um, yeah, you know, the number of stores being the same. This is saying, what was the impact of COVID? Now, COVID might have caused the number of restaurants listed to increase, but that's an impact of COVID. You know, if COVID caused that, that is part of the causal effect. Right. Now, all this here is looking at, it's just restaurant delivery sales, period. So, so there are uh, a number of causes that might have driven these, uh, these impacts that we see, including potentially uh, you know, store listings, but um, again, we're not trying to unpack that. What we're trying to unpack is what is the, the impact of COVID uh, across all those causes. Um, now, I'd say one other point I make about the number of store listings. So uh, if you actually, we have a, an alternative data company that provided us the total number of restaurant listings um, for each of the individual services, you know, Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, and, uh, and some of the others. And what you'd actually find is the, the number of restaurant listings before COVID had been increasing very steadily. And after COVID started, there was actually a slight dip. And then it actually continued to increase at the same rate that it had before COVID started. So you would, what I would have thought in advance is the same thing that Sabrina is saying, that you know, now that COVID has started, tons of restaurants are listing that hadn't listed before. But what you find is that's actually not true. And uh, maybe it's a combination of some restaurants going out of business, but uh, it was actually, uh, there was no dramatic change in, in restaurant um, listing behavior. Uh, one more question. Why is there a band around the line chart? Uh, the band around the line chart represents the, uh, it's basically like you can think of it as a confidence interval. So there's kind of the, the observed average spend that we saw, um, but we, we know that we only have a certain you know, relatively limited number of people in the cohort. And so if we were to account for our uncertainty based on sample size, um, it's also possible that the, uh, the average spending per cohort member could have been some other number. Uh, hope, hopefully that makes sense. These are great questions, keep them coming. This is, uh, this is great. So again, the idea here is if we know that the tenure effect tends to go like this, again, I'm, I'm just doing this in qualitative terms. And we know that for the 2019 cohort, over the pre-COVID period, we've seen kind of the first smile. Then we can take the tenure effect that we've estimated from those other cohorts and use that to get what we would have expected the no COVID spending behavior to be. 
So we're just kind of taking that same tenure effect and just carrying it out over the, the next 52 weeks. And that gives us a much better estimate of the COVID effect. Now, the actual methodology we use, you could think of it as, a, as an enhanced version of this. There's other things that we control for, uh, but this is kind of the, the essence of uh, part of the idea. And while I'm not gonna bore you with details, uh, the model fit is excellent. This relatively simple specification that we use, it explains something like 99% of all the variation in the data. If you had an R squared of 99% for spending behavior across a whole bunch of cohorts, you'd feel pretty good. So, so this, uh, this method, we feel quite, quite, quite strongly that this is a very valid method for this data. So what does it all mean? <clears throat> Well, let's look at the impact of COVID. And the way that we're looking at it is through percentage lift. And so all this is saying is, if we were to take uh, this overall sales impact, what we can see is right after COVID started, sales in restaurant delivery were 113% higher than they otherwise would have been had we had no COVID. So sales were more than double what they would have normally been. And what's interesting is as we kind of move forward over time, we see this gradual decline in, in the lift such that by July of 2021, the lift is only 42%. So 42% still very significant. That's a big, a big jump, but it's about one third of what it had been at the peak. And then again, the question is, how'd that come about? Well, it was mostly actually because of expansion of the number of active customers, that doubling in sales, about 60% of that was coming from um, from active customer growth. So this just means a lot more people were kind of re-entering the category. But we can see that the number of active customers has been uh, very steadily declining, you know, such that the, the lift to active customers is only about 13% as of July. The increase in order frequency has been remarkably stable. So COVID just caused people to order more frequently. About, about 15, you know, 13 to 15% more. Uh, the, the bump in average order size or, or you know, basket size was about 20% uh, at the start of COVID and it's about 10% uh, as of July. So again, we can see that with active customers and with basket size, there's kind of been this gradual decline uh, relative to what we had seen at the immediate onset of COVID but order frequency, that's been a fairly stable, uh, fairly stable lift. So, so the impact of COVID has been significant, but we can see some evidence that um, you know, the main driver of it, which is the active customers has been, uh, it's been kind of falling away uh, relatively quickly. Now a question you might wonder though is, okay, you know, so we see this impact, it's smaller than it was, but it's still 42%, which is nothing to shake a stick at. Is that, like, why is that? Is that because COVID is still lingering? It's just gotten, you know, weaker? Or is it that COVID is not really exerting much of an effect now, but people have kind of put this, 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 this new behavior into autopilot, you know, which I would call habituation. I would say that it's that second explanation that people have put restaurant delivery, some people have put restaurant delivery on autopilot, even though COVID is not really forcing them to anymore. And there's three, three big reasons why. The first reason is um, when we look at the number of, of, of people, of prospects who are adopting for the first time. So again, this was a chart I showed you before. And what we can see is, you know, for one, as I mentioned earlier, the number of adoptions has been uh, falling off cliff technical term, <laughs> it's been dropping significantly such that it's well below uh, pre-COVID levels. But even if we were to take that pre-COVID trend line and just extrapolate that forward, we can see that even as of July of 2021, we're kind of at the pre-COVID trend line. So, so prospects are behaving as if COVID never happened. Now imagine that we were to look at the, the customers that were born during COVID what we would see is that they're behaving as if COVID never happened too. And the way that I'm gonna suss that out is by just looking at a whole bunch of cohorts. I love looking at cohort spending. It's a lot of fun, trust me. <laughs> so this is uh, looking at all of the, the customers that were born uh, as of July of 2018. 
What we can see is that average spending per cohort member, similar to the chart that I showed before, you had been, you know, call it about $5 per cohort member. And then during COVID, it jumped up to, you know, 10, 10, 11, 13, uh, almost $15 uh, per cohort member. And I'm just going to kind of keep roll, rolling forward the clock. Let's look at all these other cohorts that were born subsequently. You know, these are the customers that were born December 2018. These are the customers that were born in March of 2019. All very similar shape that they were kind of, you know, spending about five bucks uh, per cohort member. And then we saw a sharp increase. But as we kind of move forward to the cohorts that were born after COVID, what we can see is that they're spending much, much less, actually. So, you know, here are the most recent three uh, acquisition cohorts. If we were to focus, say, on that, that second last one, this is the, uh, the bottom column, uh, third one over, uh, the customers that were born in December of 2020, we can see that as of the 25th week of life, they were spending about $3.6 per cohort member. And what I've done is I've drawn an arrow that shows what that oldest cohort had spent in its 25th week of life. And we can see that it's like smack dab on the line. So these cohorts, they're spending like the old cohorts were before COVID started. And that's what I mean when I say prospects and post-COVID customers are spending as if COVID didn't happen. <clears throat> See a couple questions and comments here. Uh, what was the net increase in delivery sales if you take out the in-restaurant dining? Well, in-restaurant dining, maybe I'm not understanding the question, um, but in-restaurant dining would not uh, contribute to these sales figures. Yeah, these are only uh, restaurant delivery orders. Uh, what about inflation impact? $5 in 2018 is not $5 in 2022. Now, inflation has gotten worse uh, recently, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I think as of, as of this analysis, I don't think we had, you know, 8% year-on-year inflation. Um, you, would, you would see that entirely within, presumably within basket size. Uh, so again, we had showed that average order value uh, had been like a 20% lift and it fell to about 10%. Maybe if you were to strip out inflation, you know, maybe that lift would be even smaller than that. Uh, is there data that shows that the decline in delivery sales has been off, offset by in-restaurant dining? That's what we're gonna to move to next. Great question. So again, I've shown both prospects and uh, customers that were born after COVID started. They're both behaving as if COVID never happened, but exactly to Michael's question, we had done a, a detailed econometric analysis that showed uh, essentially, you know, what was driving those gains, you know, what were the mechanisms? And uh, as Michael's alluding to, one of the biggest drivers of gains to restaurant delivery was substitution away from physically dining in. So, you know, we all love Chick-fil-A and earlier, you know, we were going to it very frequently. Now that Chick-fil-A is closed, a lot of these people were turning to companies like DoorDash. And what's very interesting is if we were to look at a chart of national restaurant dine-in visits per capita, you know, this is just you know, a measure of the frequency with which people are physically dining in at restaurants, uh, which we were able to get from uh, a geolocation data company. What we see is that the number of visits had been relatively uh, elevated, we saw this big decline because of COVID. We saw a relatively sharp snapback, but to a level that was lower than what we had seen before COVID. But as of March, 2021, restaurant dining activity was actually back to pre-pandemic levels, believe it or not. So, you know, so for the last bunch of months of our data set, restaurant dining is what it had. Been. And so, you know, that, that sign's gone away. And again, that's one thing that's really interesting to see that uh, we're still seeing that 42% expansion, even when restaurant dine-in activity is back to what it had been before. So you know, just to kind of summarize, prospects, they're behaving as if the pandemic never happened. Customers that were born after COVID started, they're also behaving as if COVID never happened. People are physically dining in at restaurants uh, as much as they had been before COVID started. 
So that factor is basically the same. And yet we still see this evidence that sales from those existing customers is 42% higher than it was before COVID started. So that's why we would conclude that some customers have formed new habits. They've put restaurant delivery on autopilot in their lives, uh, even though they're not being forced to anymore. So I thought that was a, a very uh, interesting analysis that shows, you know, again, you know, first, what are the, what is the impact of COVID and just how persistent is it in the sense that people are doing it despite not being kind of quote unquote forced to. So what does this all mean? <clears throat> so, so the good thing for the category is existing customers have made habits out of this higher level of restaurant delivery usage. They're just doing it more. You know, they're, they're placing orders uh, now when they never would have before uh, just because of muscle memory. The bad news is customer adoption has been falling off a cliff as I showed you know, a, a couple of times now. And it seems like the new normal, how people are spending now, you know, now that COVID's kind of been, been waning is the same as the old normal for all the people that were born after COVID. They're basically the same as customers that were born before COVID started. But then finally, we're seeing this evidence that existing customers are habituating away to the old normal as well. So if we go back to that same chart that we showed before, we can see this very steady decline in the lift uh, over, over this, this period. And one can argue that earlier on, obviously COVID had been uh, exerting much more of an influence on our behavior and that, that had been uh, you know, kind of waning. But in that last handful of months, you know, after March of, March of 2021, COVID wasn't really doing anything, but we were still seeing a decline in lift. And so if we just kind of were to continue to extrapolate that, that decline in sales lift, uh, what we would infer is that right around now, actually, the sales lift would fall to 0%. It would go away. So again, we can't claim that that's what's going to happen because that would be extending beyond our data. But I think that there is some evidence that, uh, that we're very strongly moving in that direction. And there's actually uh, evidence that this has been happening. So I'm not sure how many people have read this uh, Wall Street Journal article about uh, how the pandemic was, you know, it was supposed to change everything, you know, going back to McKinsey's title, and how it hasn't in some ways. And one of the charts that it showed was really quite striking. Uh, what it showed was uh, estimated e-commerce sales as a percentage of retail sales. So this is basically the proportion of retail sales that was being conducted online. And this is data coming from the Census Bureau, you know, pretty, pretty credible data source. So from 2000 up until uh, COVID started, we saw this very steady increase in e-commerce penetration from, you know, call it half a percent to about 11%. COVID, COVID hits, boom, see this very sharp increase. And so what I'm showing with that red dotted line is kind of the, the pre-pandemic baseline level for e-commerce penetration. Now, what's happened since then? We're back, basically back to the level that we would have expected had there been no COVID. That was really striking. I would not have expected that. But again, what this is saying is that e-commerce penetration, sure, it's continuing to grow, but is it growing any more quickly than we would have expected had there been no COVID? No, actually. So we're back to where we would have expected to be with no COVID. Now this is, again, this is overall e-commerce sales. It's not going category by category. So it's not like um, you know, perfectly comparable to, to what we've been showing for restaurant delivery in particular, but this is showing that across all e-commerce, uh, we're seeing very strong uh, reversion back to pre-pandemic uh, pre norms. And so if we just kind of reflect a little bit on that uh, McKinsey title, uh, you know, it said it, it's transformed business forever. And I think first the forever word might be a little bit strong, but I think the other thing that I would emphasize is you know, maybe it's changed business forever in the sense that a lot of companies have made investments in um, improving ease of experience you know, through their website. Things like buy online pickup in the store are a lot easier now, curbside pickup. You know, so certainly, a lot of investments have been made, and I think it's going to make it easier for consumers into the indefinite future to, to use those services. But has it transformed consumers forever? I think that's where some of these results may, 
make you think a little bit harder. Now you may wonder, what does this imply for other categories? Well, again, we could easily apply it and we haven't, uh, we haven't done those analyses, uh, but yeah, I think the, the common denominator, which uh, we may wanna ask ourselves is, you know, how prone is the category to habit formation through regular repeated usage? Now, if you think again about how often you'd use a restaurant delivery service, that's something, at least you know, speaking for myself during COVID, you know, there were times where we were ordering restaurant delivery, I, I'm almost embarrassed to admit, maybe three, four times a week. <laughs> so we were using it a lot. Now, part of it is that we have a baby at home, but, uh, but part of it is that you know, we weren't able to go to restaurants anymore. But the fact that we were doing restaurant delivery you know, two, three, four times a week, that's enough to form a, a pretty regular habit. And it's very consistent actually with uh, what I would assume and what we've actually seen from the retention behavior at Peloton that you know, again, Peloton is one of those services that you potentially could be doing you know, every day, every other day. You know, so again, you could have that you know, potentially three, four, five times a week usage of, of the bike. And so what we wouldn't expect is uh, we wouldn't expect any sort of a spike in customer churn. Now, uh, what's interesting is I think Peloton has realized that. Uh, as recently as last quarter, we had seen no change in Peloton's churn rate. Their churn had been essentially the same as it had been before. It was super duper low. And people have been saying that we're imminently about to see a spike in churn at Peloton since their IPO, and it hasn't happened. Now, I think yeah, Peloton has been trying to take advantage of that. And they recently announced uh, something like a 10% uh, price hike on their bikes. And I think there's a lot of grumbling about it. But I think the fact that people have made this such a habit for themselves implies that um, I think by and large, we're gonna see a lot of people not canceling. Yeah, I think that their churn rate will move up as we've seen with Netflix, but um, you know, will it move up so much that it totally offsets the, the, the price increase? Uh, doubtful to me. Wayfair would be uh, kind of a, an interesting contrast to this. This is a category, you know, so they're a furniture retailer. It's a category where you don't buy every, you don't do this every week. You know, you buy their stuff when you do a home improvement or when you're setting up that, that work from home uh, office, like the one that I'm in right now. So it's just not something that you would expect to form quite an enduring habit over. And so this is a category where I would expect a much more severe um, kind of reversion back to normal uh, because people did not have the opportunity to form those strong habits as they would have with restaurant delivery and with, uh, you know, with something like a Peloton. So actually, I'm, I'm gonna kind of leave it at that. Um, hopefully you found this to be interesting and uh, I'd love to hear any questions that you might have. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we actually, we do have a, a few questions. Um, Wendy is asking, how do you account for all the restaurant closures in the U.S.? And does that statistic impact your analysis? Yeah, COVID caused those restaurants to close. So going back to the analysis that I had shown over here, um, this one, a restaurant closure was one of the other mechanisms that we had included in this analysis. Uh, alongside income changes, restaurant, dining activity, uh, and the like. And so uh, certainly what we saw is that restaurant closures were, were actually negative for restaurant delivery. Because, you know, it's kind of this interesting, you know, restaurant delivery has this interesting kind of dual symbiotic relationship with restaurants that if, if the restaurants close, restaurants are the supply for these companies. You know, if you had that favorite restaurant that you always wanted to go to and they shut down, well, then maybe you, know, you, you would have placed a restaurant delivery order for them, and maybe now you're not going to. So actually, the restaurant closures was a negative. And as restaurants open back up again, that actually would be a, a positive for restaurant delivery. You, you also mentioned uh, Wayfair, Dan. And with companies having hybrid workplaces now, um, uh, some are trying to go back to work more days, some are going back, uh, you know, maybe one, two, three days a week, some aren't going back at all. Are you, is that, would the way for the, the effect for Wayfair actually be on a longer curve, potentially, that behavior might change over 
a longer period of time, but would but they would still have an impact. Yeah, I think to understand like the overall impact, it could take a little bit longer at Wayfair because the end of purchase cycle is longer. You know, so people don't tend to buy as frequently, and so you, you may not necessarily know um, exactly what the impact is going to be until we've kind of observed the full purchase cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that being said, yeah, I think that. Uh, I feel pretty confident that, you know, we're just, again, people haven't had, because that inner purchase cycle is longer, that that is why people won't form the habits that they could uh, around, around a service like, like Wayfair. Right. So yeah, I think also Wayfair is kind of, they don't have that symbiotic relationship that we were just talking about with Wendy's question. You know, when, when restaurants close, that hurts restaurant delivery companies. When, Furniture stores close, that is very good for Wayfair because Wayfair is not sourcing their product from the furniture stores. You know, they're, they're sourcing it through, you know, they've got a, a dropship um, supplier network. And so what happened during COVID was uh, 85%, 85% of all furniture had been bought in stores and COVID just shut down 85% of the category. And so immediately all that business was going to Wayfair. Uh, as those furniture stores open again, that is gonna be a big negative for, for Wayfair. Right. We also have a couple more questions um, here. Uh, Linda asks, how can we relate this data to the employment sector post pandemic? Um, yeah, so employment was another factor that was negative for restaurant delivery. So again, going back to this mechanisms analysis, um, you know, store closures, that was negative. Uh, income changes was a negative. As income, you know, as as people's incomes got better, you know, that's on the margin been a positive. Um, so in general, this is a, a pro-cyclical business. If we were to move into a recession, obviously that would be a negative. Right. And Fern asks, um, how has the trucking industry, how has this impacted the trucking industry? Is there any insights for, for that industry that you can take from your research? Uh, in terms of the restaurant delivery category, I think this would be somewhat not uh, not related to trucking in the sense that restaurant, I, mean, I guess maybe trucking around the food that would go into the restaurants and and obviously the, the inflation that we've seen in food has been significant. Um, and that's not good for, for restaurants. Uh, would it be good for restaurant delivery? Well, if it's not good for the restaurants, I don't think it would be good for restaurant delivery either, because presumably the restaurants are passing on price increases to the consumer, which is going to make it, you know, pricier for the consumer, probably would drive demand down. Right. So um, Mike also uh, commented in the chat, this is great information, but when you move beyond the category level and look at individual companies, what do you look for regarding who will survive in the long run? Um, there are so many copycat food delivery companies. Yeah, that's a whole other ball of wax. And that's, you know, what I'd spent most of my prior research on is just looking at individual companies and not at the category level. Um, so I think this, this provides kind of a, a, an informative backdrop for how the cat, like for, for overall category level headwinds or tailwinds. Uh, as you move to individual companies, you really want to focus on their particular unit economics. And so I've done pretty detailed work on DoorDash, for example. And I think one of the nice things that we had seen was that uh, their unit economics were actually fairly healthy. You know, so a lot of people were uh, kind of negative on them uh, at the IPO. Uh, but what we saw is very strong repeat purchase behavior, such that the amount that they were spending to acquire customers was far lower than the amount of value that they were getting after acquisition. So again, that's the sort of thing that we talk a lot about in my CLB course, but, um, but I think that's the sort of analysis you'd really want to do. And there are a lot of companies, those copycats where, yeah, you know, they're, they're growing revenue, but they're just buying that growth. They're just throwing a whole bunch of money into marketing and discounts and promos. And um, I think this is especially true within the, the instant delivery space. Just lots of examples of people giving a uh, hundred dollars off for free, you know, just basically giving people food. Um, yeah, I think, you know, sure that they'll still be in there for a while while the VC money is flowing, but as soon as that VC spigot turns off, that's not sustainable. So 
I think that that's where the, the focus on your economics is going to become more important. Yeah, I think, Mike, you need to send somebody to uh, to Dan's customer lifetime value course coming up at the end. Don't buy it there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I also wonder, Dan, um, are there any age or gender or differences or socioeconomic geography differences that impact the research that you've done can have you drilled down into into that as well we did not i think that would be an interesting area to explore um we could pretty easily you know be able to to pull off an analysis like that but uh you know we were kind of trying to understand more like on the margin mm -hmm. what changes did covid have but uh, but i agree it could be interesting to explore like were those changes worse or better for people in you know, more affluent or less affluent areas. Um, you know, I think that that would be, that'd be interesting and our data could allow us to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Kevin asks, any thoughts on the inverse of this, which is folks cooking at home like never before? Yeah, so cooking at home, I think that's kind of the big third variable. I mean, it, and actually this, this slide that I have up over here, you, know, you kind of wonder, it's like, okay. So people are dining in, as much as they did, but they're still going to restaurants way more than they did before. So who's the loser? Cause you know, like, it's not like people are having two dinners now, you know, they're still having the one dinner. Um, and I think the loser had been cooking at home actually. It has to be, I mean, at some point there's like no other, no other alternative. Um, so I think that that has been kind of a secular loser actually, that uh, people in general have been cooking at home less. And, um, and they've been the loser uh, during COVID, believe it or not. Right. At least recently, in, in recent months. Yeah. I think we've got time for one last question and that's going to be uh, Linda's question. She says, um, uh, she'd asked a, a, a question earlier and she says, let me rephrase it. You mentioned this approach is portable to other categories. How does the change impact workers' behavior um, given the great resignation or what I like to say, the great reshuffle? Yeah, the great resignation is making it more expensive to, to, to do business. And I think it's also leading to lower customer experience, you know, that people are waiting longer. And because the, the cooks aren't as, you know, familiar with making the dishes that they're just not making as good food as before. Um, yeah, again, I think there's a question of what the alternative is. Like, would that be more of a factor for restaurant delivery versus, um, you know, the restaurants themselves. Uh, that I don't know. I know that DoorDash had commented on, you know, how their, you know, their, their workforce has been harder to maintain. Um, but somehow I would have thought that the gig economy has been um, more resilient in some sense than, you know, employees going into the restaurants for full-time jobs. So, so if that is the case, then I think that might be more of a negative for for the restaurants themselves than for the restaurant delivery companies. Although again, they are kind of chained at the hip that if uh, if the restaurant quality goes down, then demand for the restaurant delivery services that would be ordering from those same restaurants is going to go down too. Well Dan, this has been um, this has been fascinating. I know in my household the 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 behaviors have have changed and the increased um we've certainly increased the amount of times that chipotle and chick-fil-a have come into our house as well as the local restaurants so thank you so much i'm going to hand over to pam tipton to close us out and thank you nicola um so thank you dan for joining us today and for sharing your insights I know this has been some fun research work that you've been doing, and we are so happy to have you with us today. And thanks to our participants for joining us uh, week to week. We look forward to seeing you on the first and third Thursday of each month. So let's take a look at what's coming ahead. Um, our very next one, we welcome back Tom Smith and Bill McKinnon to uh, re-look at what's going on with the economy and me, what's been happening, what might be coming next. Um, that'll be followed by Rajiv Garg talking with us about the rise of virtual social medias. And then in June, we are really excited, as Nicola mentioned at the beginning of the session today, 
We're launching a new program in August and Jesse Boxstead will be here to share some of his insights about how we uh, derive strategic insights using AI and machine learning. Also, Nicola mentioned we have some really exciting opportunities coming up with what we call our extended learning courses. And those are actual seats in our degree programs from our executive MBA and our evening MBA programs. Look for the launch of that coming on March the 6th. And also we invite you to join our website and check out our short courses. Um, if you want more information, please feel free to reach out to my colleague, Tammy Long. Her contact information is here. And with that, we say thank you again for joining us with Business Over Breakfast this morning with Dan, and we look forward to seeing you in the coming days. Have a great rest of the day.